Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon by Dr. Bill Waddell is the what and the why of the wise men at Christmas. We're officially having our, our Christmas service t- today. We've sang Christmas songs together. We're going to be looking at a Christmas passage. If you would like to turn with me to Matthew chapter 2, uh, it's where we're going to be, sort of taking a little break from our study there in Luke and jumping over here to Matthew because of a particular story that I want us to focus on. And it's the story of... Uh, the guys that we call the wise men, uh, otherwise known as the Magi, a better name for them, at least in the scriptures, because they're not called wise men in the Bible. Uh, they are actually referred to, I should say, in, they may be in your translation, but they're not in the Greek or the Hebrew. They're called Magi. And uh, who are they? What are they? Why are they uh, in the text? Let's, let's take a look and see what it says, and then we're going to jump uh, into, into some discussion here, or actually monologue. I'm not going to let you talk. So. Uh, about them. Take a look. Chapter 2, Matthew says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the Magi, and this is as much as two years after Jesus has been born. This is not the day after. This is not a week after. This is not a month after. This is, these guys live more than a thousand miles away. There's no airplanes or, you know, fast track trains or anything. So you're looking at as much as two years to be able to get to where Jesus is. And, and as you'll see in just a minute, they, they, when they come to Jesus, they come to a house, so not to a manger, not to a um, stable or anything like that, because, you know, Mary and Joseph have moved on. With their, they don't sit there waiting for the Magi to show up, you know, for two years. So, so in the days of Herod, the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Notice their mission. Their mission is very specific. Gathering together all the chief priests. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 3. And then Herod the king heard it. He was troubled. The word there is terrified, actually, in the Greek. And all of Jerusalem with him. So, I don't know, would it scare you to death? For I mean, we, we, we have an idea of these, these wise guys, if you will, that wasn't the same as Herod's, nor of an entire city of Jerusalem. I would suggest to you, if, if our interpretation of who they were differs with the way the people in that day interpreted them, that we, you and I have something we need to change. And we're going to try to do that here together today. Herod was terrified, literally, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes and the people, he began to inquire of them where this Christ was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi. So he's got this separate meeting with them, supposedly uh, trying to play the nice guy. He definitely was not. Ascertaining when the time of the star appeared, and he he sent them to Bethlehem. So notice he hasn't seen the star. Apparently no one else has except for the Magi. Sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and make careful search for this child, and when you have found him, report to me, and I too that I too may come and worship him. Of course, we know he's not interested in worship at all. He's trying to kill him. Having heard the king, they went their way, and lo, the star which they had seen in the east went on before him until it came and stood over there where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced. So apparently the star's been out for a while. Now it's back on. They saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. When they came into the house, notice not manger, not stable. Just a point. He saw the child with Mary and his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. The word literally is to lay flat on your face. Just flat out. And opened their treasures. They presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their own country by another way. So who are these guys? Uh, Understand, first of all, they're in your scripture. They're, they're, they're sort of a shoehorned in here as far as the story of, of Christmas is concerned because they like said, you're, you're some year to maybe even two years after the birth of Jesus. So this isn't Christmas anymore. But, and and their, their story is not in Luke. Luke's got a, a, the story of Christmas and it doesn't include the Magi because they were not there for Christmas. But Matthew shoehorns these guys in and it, they, they have, because of the way Matthew has presented them here, they have become a part of our Christmas story. They're here in our manger scene. Here's these guys. Well, you know, this isn't accurate. I already just now told you that what we're pre- presenting here and what I just read in the Bible are not the same thing because this is not, you know, they wouldn't have been there. At least, like I said, you're, you're at least a year, a, a horse ride a year away. Uh, these guys are coming from Iran. 
So it's, it takes a while to get there. So, so why these guys and uh, why are they placed in this story? And, uh, and I can give you a short answer is because the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. They're here because you need to know them. I need to know them. So, so now let's, since we're, let's settle with that. So let's, let's get with it then. Let's figure out who these guys are. First of all, we need to weed through what I'm calling Magi lore. And there's a lot of that. There's a whole bunch of, there's a whole a lot of fables and, I don't know, um, mystic traditions that have surrounded Christmas, but man, none more than the Magi. These guys, uh, it's almost like we know almost nothing true about them because we know so much, we have believed so much stuff that is fairy tales. And uh, all kinds of myths and assumptions are surrounding these guys. And notice what it doesn't say, several things here in this text. And this is, by the way, the only text we have of them in relation to Jesus' birth. It's not written about anywhere else in the New Testament. It's not like we're drawing from other places and we can hear other sides of the story. No, this is the only place that we know anything about them in relation to, to the birth of Jesus. Notice, first of all, it doesn't say anything about being kings. They were not. So we three kings of Orient... We ain't, if we can add that. <laughs> We're not. It doesn't, nor does it say there's three. Do you see number three in there anywhere? It's, well, it's not in your text. So where'd you get that from? Myth. Those are myths. They're not bad myths, but you're added to the text of Scripture. These are not accurate descriptions of who these guys were. They were not kings. They never were, historically nor biblically. They were not. We know a lot about them historically. We know a lot about them from the Babylonians, from the Persians, from the Archimedes. That we know a lot about them. They were never kings. In fact, their whole job was to not be a king. Their job was actually to inaugurate kings. They had a completely separate position in the world of the politics of those days. Uh, again, not three, and there were no camels. Isn't that interesting? So it just blows. I mean, all your Hallmark cards, you got to throw all those away <laughs> because, uh, because these guys, you know, just, if, just allow the text to say what it says, well, they cease to be what we always thought they were. And like I said, lots of myths and, and mysteries that have surrounded these guys. Some say that they were the three representatives of the sons of Noah, which, one, number one, as I told you, there is almost certainly not three of them. Uh, and that they were the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I mean, where does that come from? Uh, total myth. Uh, even actually over time, the church, in church history, in some 500 years after the event here, by the way, uh, they, start, they gave them names. You've probably heard the names, have you? I'll give them to you. Not that they matter, but Gaspar, Balthazar, uh, Melchior. Uh, so how did they come up with the names 500 years later when we didn't have them at the original event? Matthew could have written them down for us, but he doesn't. And so they don't exist as far as we're concerned. Uh, others have related uh, the word magi to magician and, um, because they say, well, they were magicians, and so that's why we started calling them magi, and actually that's inaccurate. It's actually the other way around. Uh, they were called magi, but because they dealt in dark arts, we started using the practice of dark arts to refer to the, uh, the word magician came from that. So, it's, you know, don't get the chicken or the horse before the cord or the chicken before the egg. The egg was they were called magi. That's an untranslatable word. Uh, we have it in Hebrew, we have it transliterated into Greek, and no one knows what it means. Uh, all that we know, historically speaking, not just the Bible, but extra, extra biblical history, is that they were a certain class of people, in some ways like a tribe. Uh, they were almost, um, they were the secret order of men who had this club, almost like the lodge. And you could only get in if somebody brought you in, and you had to go through all kinds of rites and services and a tremendous amount of education. Uh, it would be better if your father had been one of them, and then you could inherit that. But not even then were you guaranteed to be in it. You could only be a male to be in it, uh, because they were only there's only you know. Of course, you have a bunch of wise men. You mean you had to have even wiser women to be able to control these guys. So it goes without saying. I know that goes without saying, but nonetheless, you know, every male, every married man here knows that that's true. Um, they were king makers. They had a separate religion, separate belief system. They had a very high moral standing. They were monotheistic. They believed in a single God, which was very unusual, because uh, none of the other the kingdoms that they served, which includes the Babylonians, the Persians, the Medes, the, the Parthenians, the Achaemenids, none of them had, they had multiple gods, all kinds of pantheistic gods. They were monotheistic. They, had, they, had, uh, they believed in a single God who was a creator. They believed in a Messiah that was coming, even though they didn't, in a broad sense, they believed similar to what the Bible says. But in a, narrow, in a small picture sense, they had all kinds of weird, weird ideas about those kind of things. So to say that they were correct is, is far from 
uh, you're far from the truth. But nonetheless, they were, they were monotheistic and correct as much as the Islam is monotheistic and correct. Does that make sense to you? Of course, they're not. But they are monotheistic. So that's kind of, if, if, in a relationship to Christianity to Islam, is kind of the difference between the Magi and, and Hebrew. Uh, uh, throughout all, though, here's what we do know for sure about them. Throughout all the Babylonian, Median, Persian, Parthenian, Archimedes dynasties, no one became king without their say. They're sort of like the original uh, monks living up on a hill that you would consult every 10 years when you had to make a major decision. Otherwise, you didn't talk to them, and they didn't want to talk to you. They were totally separate and almost like a, their own uh, tribe of people, like I said, in some ways. And they were trusted to wisely choose successive kings. That's what they did almost exclusively. Didn't do anything else. So what are they doing in this story? Well, they're choosing a king. That's what they did. That's what they did for a mill millennia, literally, uh, over vast uh, world-conquering empires. That was their job. They translated from one to the other. So that's what the Magi aren't, if you will, and what they are. Uh, but the Magi actually are not all, they are everywhere in your Bible. I shouldn't say everywhere. There are a lot of places that you didn't know. And I want to show you several of those places. Uh, first of all, here's, here's one. Here's Old Testament, Jeremiah 39, 3. This is just an excerpt from the story of Nebuchadnezzar coming and conquering Jerusalem and destroying the temple and burning all the major buildings. And then once he had gotten everything kind of leveled, basically he comes in to render judgment. In order to render judgment, he brings in his officials. And when he does that, this is notice the guys that he brings in. Then all the officials of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. That would be a Jerusalem. So they've got this pile of rubble called Jerusalem. Now they're about to render judgment on all the captives. Nergal Sarezer, that's a really cool name. He's got a, there's another guy on this list named that. We're going to look at him. Uh, Samgar Nebu, if you're looking for names for your kids, there you go. I think those are great names. And then we started getting into names and titles. Sar Sekum the Rab Saris. Rab means chief. So I'm not sure what Saris is, but he was the chief of whatever that was. The next guy is a very, a very important, pertinent interest. Nergal Sarezer, the Rab Mag. The Hebrew word is magus. The exact same word translated into Greek here, magi. He's the head of one of those. Makes sense, since Nebuchadnezzar was appointed as king by those guys, that he brings along with him when he's rendering judgment. He's wanting to bring one of these guys along because they were wise men. They didn't just do kings. They also did other things. So he would have, the king would have him as his advisors. He was the bribe mag. He was the chief of the magi. So there you have it, way before Jesus. This is 600 years, close to, close to 600 years before Jesus. And then the most famous, I'm not going to get to that one yet. Because I want to show you that's the Old Testament. Here's the New Testament. So Paul and Silas start on their first missionary journey. They go over to the island of Cyprus. And while they're there, they're opposed by this Jewish sorcerer, this mad magician. By the way, the word in, in, in Greek and ultimately translated into Hebrew, or trans, Hebrew translated into Greek, is magi. He's a magi. But Elymas, the magician, see, they were not necessarily, it was not an ethnic thing. It was a, like I said, it was like a men's club. But man, did he, he probably was born, his father probably was one of those. Remember, Israel is exiled for, well, they've been in exile. A lot of Israel's remained in Babylon, and some of these people became magi. We're going to see one of those in just a second. The guy you never knew was a magi. And of, of that tradition is this Elymas guy who turns out to be in, in opposition to these first missionaries. Notice Elymas, the magician, for so his magician, so his name was translated, was opposing Paul and Silas, seeking to turn the proconsul away from him. Remember this guy, Paul pronounces a curse on him, he goes blind. So not all these magi were good people. I mean, you've got some wise men here, they're doing what, you know, as we're going to see in just a second, what they were taught to do. But they, just because they were called a magi didn't make them good. All right? Here you've got, in two cases, you've got one that's conquering Jerusalem, destroying God's people and God's city. And then this guy who's opposing uh, the first, first missionaries, they were magi. But they, you wouldn't like them. You wouldn't have. So, again, they're all over your Bible. And the place that, that they are, did you know, did you know, you're about to know, that a Magi wrote one entire book in your Old Testament? An actual Magi. Not just a Magi, the chief of the Magi. You probably never knew him that way. His name was Daniel. 
Here you go, Daniel chapter 5, verse 11. King Nebuchadnezzar, this is now Nebuchadnezzar's passed away. Remember, Daniel interprets dreams. The Magi were big into interpreting dreams. Nebuchadnezzar, when he has his dream interpreted in chapter 2 of Daniel, if you remember the story, he tells Daniel, he makes Daniel the chief. Chief of what? Watch. Demon Nebuchadnezzar, your father, this is now third generation down from Nebuchadnezzar. Your father, the king, appointed Daniel chief of the, yeah, we call them magicians. They were, yeah, they did some magic stuff, we may think, but they were magi. Of the conjurers, the Chaldeans, the diviners. Daniel was put in charge by Nebuchadnezzar, who's now dead by this time. He was put in charge of the Magi for decades. So what do you think he did with their magic books? Whoop! What do you think Daniel thought, taught from? Now you know why these weirdos, if you will, show up at Jesus' birth. How did they know there was going to be a star or a king? How were they so accurate about the Bible and expecting and I've got all the Jews over there who, by the way, know the Bible, who neither see the star nor even know that there's a Jesus been born. He's been out for two years. How did the Magi know it? Well, now you know why. Because this guy, Daniel, has been in charge of them for decades. He didn't teach from their magic books. He taught from the Bible. And this is 500 years later, by the way. Talk about a good teacher. Your students are still listening to you. They passed it down for 500 years. And then, boom, when all the signs are there, they show up. Impressive. Daniel was the chief of these guys, and he was in charge of them, like I said, for decades. So who are the Magi? Well, they were a powerful ruling class of individuals. Uh, we think mostly we consider these wise guys as some benign trio, I don't know, roaming the desert in some fancy clothes on the backs of camels, basically, uh, you know, basically hapless and harmless, and they were far from that. They were far from that. Go back, look, look here again. So, you know, Herod was a major power broker. Look at verse 2. Where, where is he that's been born king of the Jews, they say to Herod? For we have seen a star in the east, and we have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard it, he was terrified. It's the word in, in Greek. And all Jerusalem with him. So how do these hapless, harmless individuals come in, and three of them, if, if that's what it was, and make an announcement like that and terrify a whole city and a powerful king like this because it's not who, they are not who you think they were. They were the power brokers of the far middle and near east. And they had been for almost a millennia prior to this. And they remained that all the way through until Rome ca ca captured or conquered the Parthians. And they continue to be that in Iran and India and other places. Uh, they were the power brokers throughout that entire world. King makers the most power, in the most powerful kingdoms that had existed up until that day. Uh, Babylon, Persia, Medes, uh, the Archimedes, like I said, the, these, these, these powerful powers of the east. These guys, no one became king over them unless these guys said yes. And they had been doing that, like I said, dynasty after dynasty, after generation, after generation, after millennia. They had been doing this and doing this and doing this. They represented the combination, if you understand their power, they represented the combination for us for our, if, if we combined our Senate with our, um, our Supreme Court. So, so let me put a, for instance, in front of you here. Let's say, say the entire Senate and the Supreme Court comes and stays on South Padre Island for a couple of weeks. Would that stir stuff up? Boy, would it. So let me, but that's not even, you're not even, still not close to how it would have affected Jerusalem and affected Herod. So let's go back 60, 70 years to the World War II era. And what if the entire German Senate and uh, uh, Supreme Court showed up on a U-boat boat on our beach, landed and spent two weeks on South Padre Island? That's the stir. Because these guys, as they come into Jerusalem, they're entering enemy territory. The, the powers of the East were the Parthians. The kingmakers of the Parthians were the Magi. They're the ruling class. The, the powers of the West were the Romans. They had, the previous 60 years, had three different major uh, clashes. And they, like I said, these guys were in the East. The Romans were in the West. They fought in the, in, in the Near East, which would have been included Syria and Lebanon and Israel. One of those, like I said, one of those buffer states is King Herod is over. And now from the east comes these ruling class, effectively an invasion. But they're not there for political or, or military reasons. They're there for a particular king reason. But nonetheless, how does he interpret this? Of course he was terrified. Of course he didn't know what to do. 
Like I said, these, these Parthians were something else. The, the, a magi, I'm sorry, for these magi to ride in Jerusalem, it tells us several things about them. Almost certainly there weren't three. I mean, they didn't do anything like that. When they made kings, they did it collectively. So you would have, if, if, if we can call them the lodge, the whole lodge comes from Iran. Hundreds possibly of these guys, not riding camels. Again, you're entering enemy territory. You would be riding steeds of war. And, and what are the, the Iranians? They're not known for camels. Neither are the Arabs, even though they're not afraid to ride them. They were known for Arabian horses, right? That's what these guys were riding. And by the way, they would have had an entourage of military escort in the hundreds, maybe thousands, including everybody, you know, you got to pe have people that work on carts and people that cook and people that know how to shoe horses and, you know, Plus, you're going to be gone for a couple, maybe a couple of years, your wives and kids with you. This was no, you can, now can you understand why they stirred the whole city up? They basically came in with their own city. Here we are. And Herod, you need to know about this guy. Herod is a guy who, by the way, first of all, his position as king, he, he bought it himself. He's been kissing up to the Roman people. They've been having wars. The Parthians and the Romans have been having wars in the Middle East and the Near East in, in, in his little buffer zone called Israel. And he has fled two different times back to Rome in order to beg them not to get rid of him effectively because he, didn't, he couldn't handle the, the, his responsibilities, which is to keep the Parthians out. And now here it is one more time. The Parthians have come in. And so he's quaking in his boots because that's how he gets his money. And that's how he gets his support. And now he, hasn't, he wasn't ready for them this now re most recent invasion. Uh-oh. So, so he's pretty upset. And so he's expecting there's going to be terms of peace or something or terms of war or whatever. And then, boom, this whole thing of where's the real king of the Jews? That's effectively what they say. By the way, Herod's title that he bought with his own money was king of the Jews. And so when they come in and they say, where is he that's been born king of the Jews? It's as if me coming in where you're working and you're the boss of it. And I say, where's the real boss in this place? How's that going to make you feel? Now, it's one thing to lose your job. It's another thing to lose your, you know, head. That's where Herod is sitting here. So that's the reason why he's terrified. Tells us they wouldn't have been on camels. There wouldn't have been just a few of them. And, and they come, with this world-renowned kingmakers come into enemy empire to identify the king of the universe, the one that's been born, the real king, the king of the Jews. And all Jerusalem was upset with them, and not, I would say, partly because of the Parthians, which is their enemies, or there. The Jews didn't have any war with the Parthians. They, they hated the Romans. They were happy to have the Parthians maybe come and get rid of the Romans. But the issue that they have, not so much with the Parthians being there, these kingmakers being there, but the fact that Herod, who is their leader, whether they like it or not, that he's upset. You do not want Herod to be upset. Because when Herod got upset, people died. What happens in this story? We didn't read the rest of the story. So they go, they don't go back to Herod. And so what does Herod do? He goes and makes a thorough search for Jesus so that he can worship him. No. He sends his soldiers out and heals every single male in the region of Bethlehem under the age of two because that's the way he rolled. He dies within two years of this event. Within two years, Herod is dead. He's an old man at this point. He dies. He goes to Jericho, which is where his pal one of his palaces is. He passes away there. He's on his deathbed. Here's just how he rolled. While on his deathbed, he orders that all of his officials go back to Jerusalem. And they arrest all the leading men of Jerusalem and the surrounding area. And they hold them until he dies, which he knows is inevitable. And here was his order, and they carried it out. Upon my death, as soon as you hear that I die, you're to execute all these men, several hundred of them. Because here was his reasoning, and he was correct. No one will cry when I die. Oh boy, they were going to celebrate. But he says, that, since no one's going to cry for me, I'm going to make sure that everybody's crying. And so he had them all executed. That is the honest truth. That's why when Herod is upset, Jerusalem is upset with him. Because boy, it's like, man, where's the cave we used to hide in? Because you better go find it. Because Herod is bad news. So, let's, so there you go. I hope that taught you a few things. Let's get on to the next thing, which is following yonder star, right? The whole song. Um, what is this whole star thing? I don't know if you've really paid attention to it, but it's weird. It's super weird. And again, and one more thing that has all these mysteries that surround it and stories and ideas. Uh, what was the star? Well, it says it's a star, right? So it must be a star. Well, um, yes and no. It says it's a star, which is a word that in the Greek refers to a celestial body like, a, like our sun, which is a star. 
But it's also a word used in the New Testament and the Old Testament to refer to all kinds of things, including people. It, it doesn't refer to what it is. It refers to what it does. In other words, it, it, it actually, the word literally means a bright, shining object in the sky. It could be a human. It could be an angel, often referred to as an angel. It could be the glory of God. And that I would submit to you, probably that last one, is probably what you're looking at here. First of all, none of the scenarios fit. So here, here's the scenarios that people have come up with. They, so they think it's an actual star that's supernova. That's a theory. Can't prove it. They also think others that it's an alignment of several planets like Saturn and Jupiter, which, by the way, is happening tomorrow. I don't know if you know that. People are like, isn't that cool? It's close to Jesus' birth. I don't know if I told you, but Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. We know that absolutely certain. Almost certainly in the spring or fall or summertime. So just because it's aligning this time of year doesn't mean that's what it was, okay? Because this isn't the time that Jesus was born anyway. So, but go watch that. But anyway, they think it was, could be that. They think it could have been a comet. They think it could have been a really slow meteor. And I'd say, yeah, that's pretty slow. So we saw it back, I don't know, a year and a half ago, and it's still hanging in the sky waiting for you to get over there. I don't, I don't get, and it goes off and on. You know, it just doesn't fit those scenarios. I mean, it's, it's, you can hold those positions, but I, I don't think they fit. They certainly don't fit the evidence given to us in Scripture. So first of all, it tells us it's a star in the New Testament. It also tells us here's, here's Numbers 24. Here's the first, the first and only time we're told that there would be any kind of star. Numbers 24, 17, a star shall come forth from Jacob and a scepter shall rise from Israel. These guys knew that obscure verse in the Bible. How do they know it? Again, hats off to Daniel. Hats off to him. You're your kingmakers. You're going to be anointing the greatest king that ever will or ever, ever has been or ever will be. And here's one of the ways you're going to know. A star will rise in Jacob. So he, they knew that verse. Hats off to this guy. He was a great teacher. So, so it, again, the, the Hebrew word here, though, for star is ambiguous. Again, we immediately assume it's some kind of celestial object. Not necessarily. That word is consistently used of celestial objects. It's also used of angels. And it's also used of the shining of God, the Shekinah glory, as it's called. Consistently in the Old Testament. So which one is it? I think we can eliminate a star that isn't a celestial body. And here's the reasons why. Some usual characteristics that don't fit that kind of celestial body. Number one, the Magi see it, but no one else does. Now, we, we assume... And that's all it is, that everybody saw it. Show me one place where anybody else reflects on it. You think Mary and Joseph would have caught that? I would think that, I mean, they saw a bright shining in the sky, the, the shepherds, but it turned out to be angels, did it not? And maybe that's what we have going on here. But they never call it a star. And, and when they get there, Herod and, and all of his officials are all, what? What star? When did it arrive? They, none of them saw it, but the Magi saw it. So that doesn't fit a typical star. I think you would agree with me. Nobody else saw it. And they see it in the east. So, well, yeah, that means they were over in the east, and that's where they came from. Yeah, they came from the east, but they saw it in the, while they were in the east, they saw it in the east. So let's picture a map of the middle and mid, mid and, and near east. So we have Iran, then we have Iraq, then we have Jordan, and then we have Israel over here. It's to the west of Iran. So they were in Iran. They see the sign of Jesus. By the way, Jesus is born in the west, but the sign is in the east. So it wasn't like they woke up and they looked over there. There's a star hanging over there in the east. That must be where Jesus is. That's not what the scripture says. That's not the evidence. The evidence was as they were living in the east, looking to the east, and they saw this star, whatever it was. Now, if you're familiar with the scriptures, you know God's big on east. East is a direction that's of significance for him. His temple that he builds under Solomon, his tabernacle that he builds with Moses, all of them face east. It also tells us in the New Testament when Jesus comes back, he's going to come back from which direction? It's got to be one, right? East, it says. Why is God big on the east? In fact, it tells us when Jesus comes that the sign that he's going to present, that whatever that sign is of his coming, is going to be shown in the east. So could it be possible that this, now, this first coming of Jesus albeit much less, is going to be a similar sign in that way and find it in that direction. Yeah, I think that's probably what you're looking at here. This star, another weird thing about it is it disappears and reappears uh, after they talk to Herod and that it moves. It, it goes from one place to the other. I don't know if you, where y'all live. We're, we're I mean, people from Minnesota. We got people from Illinois, used to be. People from all kinds of places, New York over here and I don't know, Minnesota and all kinds of weird, West Virginia, we got all kinds of crazy people here. I don't know if you noticed, but where you're from, when you look in the sky, 
the stars are the same as they are where we're from here. You know why? So, so for you to say over in Minnesota that it's above your house, and say, no, it's not, Sandy, it's over my house, because I live in the place where God is, you know, down here where it's warm. <laughs> it's not over anybody's house because they're, you know, six million miles from here. I don't know further than that. But we can't, nobody could say any particular stars over any particular house, and I couldn't go to Sandy's house following a, any star that's out there. Because, because they're over everybody's house. And I could be anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere, I got the same set of stars every single night. So how is it that this star only points to one place at one time, and I can be, by the way, he's in, they're in Jerusalem talking to Herod, and then the star reappears. By the way, Bethlehem and Jerusalem are only six miles apart. I mean, it's just a, a half a day's walk. So, so how is it that I can be standing in Jerusalem and know that the star is not over Jerusalem, but over Bethlehem just six miles away, and how can that be a regular star of anything that you've ever seen? I said, this is not a regular star. It just can't be. It doesn't fit the evidence. The star moves. I mean, the last time you saw a star move, not me, they're in the same place every single night. And it moves to a place that very specifically tells them which house in Bethlehem. So I didn't just get to Minneapolis to see Sandy. I got to her house in Minneapolis. Now, that's a very specific star. Never seen anything like it, neither of you. So this is whatever you thought this star was, it ain't that. The characteristics that you hear here eliminate basically all options except for this being an angel or the Shekinah glory of God or both. That's what you're left with. Again, remember, Jesus is going to appear and his appearance is going to be this sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. It tells us it's going to be in the east. What is that sign? I would suggest you it's going to be a bright shining. All eyes are going to see it. It tells us another place. In this case, it, I, I, here's, here's my opinion. Again, take it for what it's worth. What, what this appears to be is a similar shining and announcement, albeit smaller and unique, only to the Magi. Again, Jesus comes in his first coming. Very few know. He comes in the second coming. Every eye will see him, Scripture teaches. So, most important part of this story, though, is what their mission was, and we'll conclude with that. They weren't, as opposed to Herod's fears, they weren't on a political or, or military mission. They were there to identify and to worship the ultimate king. Herod was caught, caught off guard. Everyone else was caught off guard. Hats off again to prophet Daniel because he so instilled in these Gentile men that they need to be looking for this ultimate king. He'd written down, written down in his prophecies 500 years before this. Wow, just impressive uh, ability to instill in these guys the, these things. It says they came to the house in verse 11, not a stable, not a manger, to worship. The word literally is to lay flat. So you got these power brokers who have transferred from kingdom to kingdom. They have seen kings come. They have seen them go. They are above them in many ways. Um, they have inaugurated so many kings and so, so many kingdoms throughout their, the lifespan of this, this special group of guys. The Parthians, the Medes, the Romans, they have seen them all, seen them all come and go. But they, with the, so what you see here, this, this, this scenario of bringing gifts and coming into the presence. That is part of every inauguration that they had, but what is not part of every inauguration is the fact that they're laying flat on the ground. They would have not done that. They would have never done that. This is the exception. Why? Because the one they're bowing before is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Every time we get to this place in this time of year, again, we don't know when Jesus was born. We're pretty certain it wasn't this time of year, but at least we're celebrating his birth, and I think that's a great thing. But we're always confronted always need to be with this king, face to face with him. And we're always left with three options. The options we have here in this story are the same options that people are choosing today. Two are very unfortunate and one is recommended. The first unfortunate one is the response of Herod. Is, is that your position? So Jesus is a threat to you. He's a threat. You, you're, you're want, to, want to run your own life. I want to do it my way. I want to have it my way, my decisions. It's my life and my time to decide. And you can keep thinking that. But Jesus is going to interfere with that. He's either going to do it now if you allow him to, or he'll do it forever, and it'll be against you. So, so in, interfering with your plans and resenting the placement of him as ultimate king, there won't be a thing you can do to stop it. Not a thing. Or you can have the position, the majority of the position, unfortunately, is the position of the Jews, who, by the way, knew exactly where Jesus was to be born. 
off the top of their head, they can say, well, of course it's Bethlehem. And they can quote the verse right there in front of Herod, in front of these, these king makers. And, 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 and like I said, Bethlehem is just six miles away. But none of them go. So, so I have these power brokers from all over the Eastern world who were world-renowned. Power of prowess is just evident all over them. They, they've shaken Jerusalem to its core. They come saying, we believe this has happened, and these are the things that we've seen, and we need to know where he is, and you're told that. And then when they say, well, here we go, you don't go with them? Just six miles? So, so, so you know all about Jesus? That's great. But you haven't done a thing with him? That's not great. That's a problem. That's a problem. In fact, the, the problem, here's, here's the problem. It, it tells us right here, he came, Jesus did, to his own. And those who were on his own did not receive him, but to as many as received him. Here's the Magi. This is the final response. So it, says, it says, when they, when they saw his star, they rejoiced. Finally, this one that we've been taught and we believed in. Finally, the, the fruition of all these things. And so they come to inaugurate the king, but they don't do what they normally do. They fall flat on their face before him because he's it for them. Finally, they've reached the end of their destination. Finally, the final king has, has come, and they don't need to know anyone else. Uh, but you can be like the Jews were, who he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Know all about Jesus. That's great. Doesn't do you a bit of good. Hell's going to be a place of very good education, I'm, I believe. You're going to know all there is to know about the truth. You won't be able to do a thing about it. Now is the time to decide. Now is the time to bow and receive him. I want to ask you if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we think about what we've learned today. I'm grateful for these men. All, by the way, maybe I didn't emphasize this. These are Gentiles. These are not Jewish guys. These are not Bible guys. These are guys who, are, who have been with a good teacher 500 years ago, but so convinced of the truth of the word, the truth of God, the truth of his coming king, that we find him here in Jerusalem. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these men. We thank you for their faithfulness to the truth. We thank you for holding on, that they held on to you, that they held on to what they had been taught. We thank you for the faithfulness of Daniel. And God, we're just so impressed. It's, it's encouraging to me as a, as a Bible teacher to see that uh, Daniel, he, he didn't have any kind of special abilities. He just taught the truth, but you made the truth stick. So God, we're praying that that would happen today, that the truth would stick in our hearts, uh, in our minds, in our lives. We pray, Lord, as, uh, as was true for the Magi, that we would rejoice at the coming of your Son. We would rejoice because our opportunity now is to choose him. He's chosen us. He's given his life for us. And now he is the Savior. He is the King. And it's our decision to bow before him. And I pray that we would do that today. Thank you for speaking to us, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.